Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to the panel discussion webinar here. Um, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is something we have started doing now twice a year. Uh, it's the health, the healthcare breach report. Um, and so what we do here is we talk about uh, what's happening uh, in, uh, in healthcare, what the trends are. Um, and we thought of just doing it uh, once a year, but, you know, actionable data is helpful more than once a year. So we do it more than once a year. Um, my name is Jake Milstein. Uh, I'm the event host for Critical Insight. Uh, if you've been to our events before, you've seen me host them. Um, and if uh, you haven't been to the events, these are the events. Um, and, you know, one of the things that started happening when the pandemic began, which I think was 10 years ago at this point, um is that we uh we started hosting a lot of online events instead of going to in-person conferences uh and we got a lot of feedback from folks especially in healthcare that they're very helpful you can take them at your desk um and you know so this is not a sales webinar this is uh this is real information that we've compiled um and uh, we really look forward to uh, to taking you through it um a couple of housekeeping items uh number one is on the right uh there is a chat um erica said hi and mike has said hi and jenny said hi in there so far i'm curious to know where you're joining us from uh i'm in seattle um and second is at the end of this there's a survey we'd appreciate you taking the survey helps us know whether we're doing better whether we're whether we should keep doing these how we did um, if you want to put things in there about things you'd like to see in the next breach report we'd love to have that information too um, and so please stick around for that. So uh, a couple of things here. Um, so your speaker today, Vivian Zhao, uh, is our healthcare program manager. She's also the lead researcher uh, for Critical Insight, and it is her research that you're seeing here. She'll be doing a lot of talking. John Delano is a healthcare strategist for us, but in real life, he's a regional CIO for Advent Health. Uh, in Texas, um, and and, is, and has great insights into this report and uh, and helped put it together. And then Mike Hamilton is Critical Insight founder, and he's the former CISO of the city of Seattle, um, and knows just enough about healthcare to be dangerous. Um, uh, but is in all of our uh, uh, it's in all of our events. Um, one quick note for those of you who haven't been to our healthcare events before: we are a preferred provider for the American Hospital Association. Um, which means that uh, they hold us to some really high standards. We hold ourselves to really high standards. Um, and the things that we do for healthcare entities are managed section response, HIPAA security risk assessments, and continuous vulnerability identification. But I said this wouldn't be a sales thing. So now we're going to get to the good information. Um, and if you haven't gotten the, uh, the report yet, shoot me an email and I'll shoot it to you during the webinar. Jake at criticalinsight.com, which I'll put in the chat. Mike, take it away. Yo, Jake, thanks. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, if uh, some of you uh, know that uh, we have been putting out for the last, what, Jake, almost 13 years now, um, a daily curated um, news blast. And uh, here are a smattering of some of the, uh, the more recent healthcare focused articles. Um, everybody sees in the news, you know, the, the regular things, right? The hospital has been flattened, they're being extorted, um, their records are being um, uh, for sale on the dark web, et cetera, et cetera. There are some nuances to some of the things that have been happening. So I thought I would point out um, a, a few events that are a little different. So this one about stealing um, um, regulatory data, changing it, and then posting it online to make it available. Um, that's out of the box. Um, it is a strategic um, uh, effort by countries to ensure that their citizens are vaccinated and healthy before anybody else's. And so that's nation state signal right there. Um, that's not a prank. That was done very intentionally to sow mistrust in, in obviously in the vaccine. Um, and then there was the uh, unfortunate episode with Scripps Health. Um, yes, it cost him $113 million in lost revenue, but the, the biggest hit that they took there, in my view, was their reputation uh, because they handled that very poorly. They were not forthcoming with information. They were, frankly, opaque. 
and how you handle an event like that and how you communicate with the public and your customers, your patients has everything to do with what they're going to think about you when that episode is over. Um, there is a uh, Florida healthy kids that was 3 million records, uh, that was disclosed. And, um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the, um, um, the sources of a lot of these events being third parties, business associates. Well, this was a business associate. This was actually a communication design firm that had a buggy website and, um, it got hit and they lifted 3 million records. Okay. So, uh, watch out for marketing firms because they're dangerous, right, Jake? Um, and then um, this is one that will uh, that will come out on the breach report loud and clear. The costs have gone way up. I think 30% is the number. And some of the other reporting I've read um, indicates that the smaller organizations are being hit the hardest and it's being more expensive for them than the larger organizations. And I'm sure we'll dive into a lot of the detail around that. And what are some of the root causes around that? Uh, but with that, Vivian, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. All right, next slide. When we talk through some of the results in our breach report, we use the data that is on the HHS breach portal that many of you probably know as the wall of shame because if you have a breach of 500 individuals or more you must report it to the hhs and they will post the results of that breach um, live on this website it it tells you know what type of breach it was was it theft unauthorized disclosure hacking it incidents how many individuals were impacted and obviously which organization was impacted. And so this is the data that we analyzed. All right, hopping into some major findings. I'm, I don't, I, no one's surprised about this. And that's quite unfortunate that no one is shocked that the total number of breaches in healthcare facilities have just been on an increasing trend. It's you know, when we look at 2018 and onwards, it's a straight line upwards. And especially the second half of last year with that peak close to 400 breaches, that's just unfortunate and, you know, shocking. Um, and when we look at 2021, I know we're only about, you know, at this point, three quarters of the way through and it's just matching that trend. And hey, Vivian, it looks like mm -hmm. the number went down. Why did the number go down between the second half of 2020 and 2021? I mean, isn't that a good trend? Yep. It's it's good when you look at just two data points because it's either a straight line up or a straight line down. Um, but there's many, many reasons. Uh, first reason is that the second half of 2020, um, a lot of, you know, headline ransomware um, you know, a lot of healthcare facilities fell victim to that. A second reason that we at CI have hypothesized is that the first half of 2020, what was happening? The pandemic. And it's possible that many healthcare facilities just were distracted because, of course, patient care had to be the top priority. So we hypothesize that's also due to distraction, that, you know, they did not have time to take a look at breaches or investigate their alerts. And it kind of all skyrocketed and piled up into the second half of 2020. Um, in addition, re breaches are allowed to come in um, after the fact. So if HHS needs to report a breach from, let's say, uh, December of last year, they still will post that uh, live onto their website. So it, it, the numbers can continue to grow after a certain date for events that happened in the past. So. It's it's lower than 2020 H2, but it matches the trend, and we predict it's only going to go up. Yep, and I, I'll point out, too, that um, it looks like it's a pattern for H1 to be lower than H2 every year for whatever reason. And, you know, maybe it's, you know, maybe that's when criminals like to take vacations. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Our favorite topic, business associates. And... I, for all the folks here, you've talked about third party vendors and business associates for years, I want to say, you know, make sure you get good agreements with them, make sure you analyze their risk. And 
it's especially with more you know digitization di digital um healthcare happening this associates will become a huge risk and you can see it here um in 2018 business associates were linked to you know about a quarter of the breaches but now looking at 2021 it's close to a half of the breaches so you at a healthcare facility or if you're outside of healthcare just any industry you may be secure you may have great practices but if one of your vendors gets hit there goes your data and for a healthcare facility now now you're on the wall of shame and you you didn't do anything wrong so um later on we're we're definitely going to be talking a little bit about third party risk but you can plainly see you know half of these organizations they might have done everything right and then their business associates were hit all right so what types of attacks so you have to report a breach if let's say you're walking down the side of the road with a stack of paper records and then you tripped and fell that is considered you know a breach but if you look at the other types of breaches you'll see that improper disposal theft lost unauthorized access disclosure the number of breaches attributed to those reasons have stayed pretty stagnant since 2018. so what does that mean well if you look at hacking hacking and in it instance is actually the only type of breach for healthcare facilities that has just been going up and that that matches you know everyone's hypotheses but you can clearly see what is most dangerous you know risk to healthcare facilities hacking and we can see it in the numbers all right and this last part so at ci you know when we take in the breach portal data it gives the organization but hhs doesn't say what type of healthcare facility, whether it's a hospital or your clinic. And so we actually go in um, for every breach and categorize that because we really wanted to see what type of facility in healthcare is specifically getting targeted. And when we do that, what's shocking is that outpatient facilities are getting targeted as much, if not more, than hospitals. But what do you see in the headlines? It's hospital after hospital after hospital. But no one talks about, you know, that family medicine center down the street from you or your local community health center that is getting breached just as much. And they may not even have the resources or the technology to, to prevent that or, you know, reduce the impact of that. So this to me was probably the biggest and most surprising finding uh, from our beach report any breach report actually um, right here and so you know when you look at this and you look at the other data um uh john you know you're you're the guy in the hot seat you know literally and figuratively right you 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 know you're the cio at a hospital you look at this what's the first thing that comes to mind well you know certainly um we, we know that healthcare is a challenging environment to begin with, and we know that it's not slowing down and that numbers certainly bear that out. And, you know, we, we just have to remain diligent. We're looking at a situation where right now our hospitals are, are full of patients and succumbing to a ransomware attack would be devastating. Um, in fact, I think Mike used the term lights out the other day when, when we were talking. And so, you know, we, we, we have to remain diligent. And, and certainly when you look at the data in this report, um, you know, an increasing number of incidents occurring as a result of business associates or third party risk. And so I, I think that things we can do right now are certainly uh, look at how we can manage that third party risk and um, easily start with understanding where your most critical data is and who has access to that and then focusing on those. Um, most of us have hundreds, if not thousands of, of third parties uh, that, that access our data. And so, you know, you, you certainly can't get them all done at one time, but you can focus on who has access to the most critical data. And then knowing that that hacking um, is, is the preferred method uh, based on this report, um, we really need to look at, at 
ransomware protection in in response and how we deal with that and and certainly finding uh, the ability to find someone that can do 24 seven monitoring for you um, is going to be a key a key piece of that. Great. And uh, and Charlie has a question that I want to bring up here. It makes sense that clinics have more breaches than hospitals. Um, if it's also true that there are more clinics out there than hospitals, if it's true that there are more clinics out there than hospitals, given that, are clinics more or less likely to have a breach on average? Vivian? Yeah, we didn't specifically do those calculations, but it would make sense that maybe on average that clinics would have less. Um, that really, that still means that even though, you know, everyone's probably gone and had a clinic visit along with a hospital visit, so everyone's records are just as at risk, um, plus they're less resource. So it's just always concerning. And it's unfortunate that our research was able to confirm that, you know, any facility that you go to, your everyday facilities are still at risk of losing their their patient records. And, and, and Abe, I mean, is this the first time that we've seen clinics having more breaches than hospitals? Yeah, I think if you could hop back to that graph there. Let me grab it, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, hold on one second. We look at the... Go ahead and talk while I bring it up. Sure. But, you know, I think it's intuitive that the smaller organizations just because of their as you point out vivian their inability to resource things are just mm -hmm. low-hanging fruit yeah and, and it is a tactic it is a strong trend right now for third parties to be leveraged to get at the real victims yeah um you know right this this is a strategy this is this is this is not by chance yeah and if that was a great question to ask um has clinics always been higher uh than hospitals and actually no, I think this is the first time we've seen such a, a difference between the number of clinics versus uh, the number of hospitals. And granted, there are many more outpatient facilities and clinics out there than there are hospitals. Uh, however, I hope this doesn't keep trending upwards because sooner or later, then, you know, what if, if, if it's much, much higher, it, it might start matching the proportion of how many clinics there are out there with the and, hospitals. And hey, and John, when we were uh, uh, talking yesterday, you, you were talking about what, you know, not everything gets reported. So what gets reported and what doesn't get reported? Yeah, so so on the HH website, you're required to report a breach of 500 records or more. And so certainly um, that, that, that doesn't bear out all of the incidents that happen that are less than 500 um, records and and more sophisticated organizations are able to do forensics to determine um, you know what may or may not have been compromised as part of a breach and in a, in a lot of cases and and I can speak to just a, a personal example at an organization that that I was with where um, we had a device uh, that was compromised that had about two thousand patient records on it. And in doing forensics, we were able to determine that only 10 of those records had been had been looked at or touched. And so we were able to just um, uh, report out to those to those 10 patients that were potentially impacted by that. But we didn't have to report that as a breach. So there, there are probably thousands of those type of examples that don't get reported. And that might go a little bit to Charlie's question here, which is mm -hmm. sure, there are more clinics, but they have fewer patients than hospitals. So it might be that, you know, their breaches don't get reported or they may not know that they've been breached or they may not know that they, you know, how many records they had stolen. If you, so John, if you don't know, do you have to report it? You, you, you would, I, I, I think, you know, the, the challenge today is that that 500 records is a pretty low bar. So, you know, we've been digitizing patient accounts or patient records for uh, over a decade uh, and, and some people even longer. So so the reality that your database has more than 500 records in it is is probably unless you just went live with it with an electronic medical record, you're you're going to have more than 500 records. And, you know, Mike, you track the news every single day, you know, 
what do you see what are you seeing in the news are you seeing you know that it's hospitals that get reported broadly more or are you seeing that the clinics are also getting reported um, when i say reported i mean news reported yeah i'm seeing uh, well so remember <clears throat> the wall of shame is about records right and that's it so all of these other things can happen, right? They can be extorted. They can get, you know, their uh, business email compromised and, you know, send away a whole bunch of money, lose a bunch of money. Those things are reported all the time. Um, so I would, I would, you know, point out the difference between just theft of records, you know, for to monetize them by selling them or to hold them, you know, frankly, for extortion as a, as a, as a hostage. Um, but all these other things that happen and because, yes, there are more clinics than anything else, they're smaller organizations. They have a lot of difficulty in prioritizing the spend on security, right? I mean, that, that's just, that's, that's a money sink for them. And so, you know, intuitively, they're going to be targeted more just because they're easier to get into. And frankly, they are not always the target. The real target is that hospital that is the business associate. So, um, you know, I think, I see a lot of reporting about clinics and all kinds of, you know, there was uh, uh, in a laser eye surgery place that lost, you know, some ungodly number of records. It's like, how many people are getting eye surgery? Um, uh, so, yes, I do see a lot of this. It's the really big ones that grab everybody's attention because of the records, right? And I think, you know, this is important work um, to characterize this, but I, I really think that the conversation needs to be expanded out of more than just records because impacting a hospital by, you know, disrupting its operation doesn't mean people get letters from credit card companies. It means, you know, potential loss of life. And so, you know, to me, HHS should be tracking more than just, you know, how many records did you lose? Yeah. And David says, you know, the target we're seeing in the Northeast is the health insurance there you go. companies. Um, you know, so let's, so, you know, I think that that gets us into a good conversation about business associates here. So, you know, when you, uh, and, 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 and David, I was just talking to a hospital in Northeast that had a, a third party breach through a, um, I think a, a company that provides prescriptions or prescription management. Um, so, you know, John, when you see the numbers of, you know, breaches through business associates, you know, talk to me about, you know, what, what, what do you, what do you do about that? How do you improve? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you fix that? How do you close those holes as much as you can? Yeah. And in, in, in my opinion, this is probably the most difficult because we utilize so many um, vendors in healthcare and we have uh, doctors that want to bring in their, their own solutions. Um, you know, many, many of these have not been developed with security in mind and it uh, security can be seen as a, as a roadblock when you're trying to do an assessment of technology or assessment of a vendor. You don't always get cooperation or a quick turnaround. And, and certainly in a lot of cases, um, it, it's easier to bypass security than, than to, to work with them to do these assessments. And so, you know, I, I, I think in, in my career, what has what well, well, it's not a healthcare example, but it helped turn the tide. And of course, now there are plenty of, of, of healthcare examples. But, but back in the day, I, I had trouble as a security officer even getting the organization to consider expiring passwords because the threats just weren't there. Um, and, and what kind of turned that tide was when when Target got breached. Through, through their HVAC vendor. And so that became a real example that, that then we could utilize to, to help have those conversations. So I, I think it, it starts there with, with developing the governance within the organization to say that security is important, you know, and that, and that has to come from the top, from the CEO. Security is important. I don't want to be in the news. Um, what can we do? And, and then ensuring that you have that support to take that time to do those assessments so that you can ensure that your data is secure. And, you know, and, and, and Mike, I know that you control, um, certainly for our company, you know, who we use as a vendor. Um, can you talk about the layers? What, when, you, when you talk to a vendor, what do you, what do you ask them? What do you, how do you make sure that they are as secure as possible? Okay. 
so uh, here's how we do it. And this is, uh, I would say, not good enough for a hospital because when, so I mean, there, there is a continuum from procurement to contracting um, that, that needs to be, is the whole thing needs to be involved in vendor risk management. But here's the way we do it. So we have three levels of classification here. We have public, confidential, and secret. Um, and depending on the kind of information that's going to be processed, held by that vendor, by that third party, um, we ask them for a number of artifacts that map to the classification level that um, they're going to be handling. So top of the food chain is you must show us your high trust certification or your ISO certification. Um, we would never hire a vendor that handled that kind of information, honestly. <laughs> Not in today's world. Um, then, so this is an order of preference, and this is also mapped to the kind of uh, information you're going to be processing on behalf of the company. Uh, the next one is your SOC 2 report. You got to have a SOC 2, type 2, it's got to be current, or you got to give us your last one with a bridge letter that says this is underway. Um, it needs to be a type two because those are audited controls, not just, you know, aspirational things that we told the auditors. Um, if you don't have that, uh, we go to door number three, which is a, uh, an assessment by a third party against a standard that we recognize. So, you know, if we're talking about, uh, um, some kind of, you know, web application we're going to use. It's got to be measured against, um, the OWASP standard for, for example. Um, or if uh, the organization has been assessed, it's against the NIST cybersecurity frame. It's something we recognize, you know, the critical, 20 critical control, anything will do. If you don't have any of those things, you better hope that you're a marketing vendor that's not touching anything because the very last thing is the god awful spreadsheet of questions that will take you three days to fill out. So there's four levels of artifacts. There's three levels of classification. These map to one another. And then there's this order of preference. So that's how we do it here. I think when we're talking about a third party or a vendor risk management program at a covered entity like a hospital, we're talking about those business associate agreements how you involve security at the procurement level when you're going to decide on what company you're going to hire to do something um and then uh, not only you know their their assertions from a business associate um agreement um uh, but also we need to talk about what goes into the contract because as i put in in the chat we're starting to see these words unlimited indemnification and auditability so i mean yeah you told us you meet our requirements for controls we actually need to prove that. And so when you get aggressive or real about, you know, third party risk management, these are some of the things that have to be included. How you evaluate security as part of procurement, what it says in that contract, as well as the BAA, and then how auditable these controls are. And, you know, so John, uh, you know, when you think about that from, from a healthcare standpoint, you know, I, you know, is that strict enough? Do you need to be stricter? What do you, you know, what do you, what do you do? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's certainly interesting and, and you, you know, it's, I, I think maturing, but when, when you try to put this type of language into a contract, um, it, it becomes very difficult to, to get agreement from the other party. And so, you know, I, I worked with our legal team to create some standard language that we wanted to put into all contracts, um, but not everybody's willing to sign those. And so that that becomes a dance that's that's usually carried out by the legal team and, and they're they're your partner. Um, but what what I would suggest is as a uh, as someone responsible for securing the organization, you have to at least work with your legal team to get some suggested language into the contract so that you can protect yourself the best you can. And I mean, has the pandemic changed this? I mean, all of a sudden, you know, I know, you know, obviously there's an emergency going on for hospitals that's continued through the pandemic in some states right now, it's worse than others. Um, but, you know, are, is, are the medical teams asking for new things to be rushed in that are causing problems? Well, I think, you know, certainly more so last year than this year, and, and probably a good reason why in the second half of 2020, you saw an increase in, in uh, incidents. But, 
you know, last year when we were trying to get telemedicine technologies and video solutions into patient rooms so that um, providers didn't have to dress up in PPE. And, and of course, there was a, an initial shortage of, of that type of equipment. So there was a, a relaxation of the laws allowing us to extend technologies like FaceTime and other things um, to be used for a, for a period of time. And, and so that, that obviously creates a whole lot more challenges when the laws are being restricted or, or relaxed, I'm sorry. And then um, additional technologies are being uh, rushed out or implemented so that we can meet patient, patient care demands. And, and certainly it's the right thing to do, but when you're challenged with securing the organization, um, it leads to a lot of, a lot of difficult, um, situations yeah and uh something going on in the chat here is charles is asking you know with those pre-contracting assessment criteria how many potential vendors are are eliminated one thing i will offer is uh mike's spreadsheet that makes vendors cry um i i do have as a handout it's a excel sheet if people want it shoot me an email and i will i will send it to you mike we should change the title of it to excel spreadsheet that makes vendors cry um okay. but i'm curious Mike, you know, when you look at the news every day, you know, are you, um, so are you seeing, do you see that the relaxation of criteria um, actually has created breaches? Do we know? Well, you mean in the, in the rush to get telehealth implemented? Yeah, in the rush things? to get yeah, telehealth. Absolutely. And, 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 pe and people going and working at home too. It's, it is now being widely reported that people are coming back into networks with the crud that they picked up in the home network, which is lying in wait until they, you know, connect to the, the, the hospital network in this case. So, uh, yeah, I mean, all of those things, all that fast retooling, you know, a lot of bad people were watching all that stuff go on and knew where they were going to have opportunities, you know, to maybe get a foothold where there was none before. And, you know, the rapid implementation of telehealth has been a really great thing but more technology means, you know, bigger attack surface. And so, yeah, it's, you know, kind of intuitive that that's what's going on. And, you know, I, I mean, Vivian, I assume there's no mention of that on the HHS website, but, you know, as we see that go up, um, you know, is that, you know, that relaxation seems to be something that, um, uh, you know, we don't really specifically call out in the breach report. But you know, what are some of the other reasons that that we think the, that we see the numbers going up? Yeah, I think one of them is just how vulnerable healthcare is. Because I mean, John's told us this before, but there's two types of organizations: those who are compromised and who know it, and those who are just compromised but don't know it yet. And when is a perfect time for a bad actor to now come out? Um, and take down a whole healthcare system, which is probably one of the most important infrastructure, you know, right now um, in the world, you know, let alone the US just because of the pandemic. So there's many reasons why and we can't pinpoint it um, as a lot of hypotheses, but I think right now being one of the very vulnerable areas, um, if you take down a healthcare system, it impacts a lot more people um, than you know, normally would, especially during a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to shift here and talk about ransomware. I think, you know, it's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to talk about healthcare and not talk about ransomware, partially because, and, and I've been told not to curse in here, but it makes me mad. Like it makes me so mad when a hospital is shut down in the middle of a pandemic for ransomware like just happened in West Virginia and uh, and Ohio. Like, doesn't it make you all mad? So, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, John and Mike, the ransomware operators said, oh, we're sorry, we're not gonna attack hospitals anymore. Uh, Mike, that seems like it wasn't true. Yeah, that never really panned out. I mean, there may have been some, you know, ethical criminals, you know, that, that backed off of that a little bit. Um, but it, but it was such a feeding frenzy. I think you could there was no detectable drop in signal, you know, frankly. And you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier this morning. Um, a really interesting paper written about the difference between the public harm that is caused 
by snarling a hospital and making it inoperable versus the purely private responsibility to make that not happen. And, the, you know, this discussion and, 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 and more and more you see the federal government getting into this as we've changed our rhetoric around this. Um, State Department put out a $10 million bounty on anybody that could prove that these ransomware gangs were affiliated, you know, with basically the Kremlin, um, which, a, which a couple have started to do. And all this is moving toward um, public policy that we need to help tamp this stuff down. Um, you know, these, these criminals are feeding at the trough. It's, it's hard to prioritize a spend for security when your job is patient care. Um, and so the status quo is going to remain until the federal government steps in and really starts to exact its pound of flesh for, you know, these operators. And that's when it's going to die back. Until then, everybody's just going to say, here are the things you need to do to secure your network. Make sure you have backups that are offsite. All of these things to prepare for you to take a punch and bounce back. Making it stop, though, that's for the federal government to do. John, I mean, these, you know, these bad guys, you know, they said, we're not going to do this anymore. I mean, did you ever believe them? Yeah, you know, it'd be nice to be able to wave the white flag and have a truce and, you, you know, but but that's that's not the reality. And, you know, on top of that, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen um, organizations, you know, cut um elective procedures and, and, and things that actually make money. Uh, you know, most, most of us know that healthcare survives on very small margins anyway. And so when you, when you cut money producing things like elective surgeries and, and, and those kind of things, then you start to see the impact to the budget um, projects get cut. And even more recently now we just have, we have so much burnout among, um, clinicians. And so implementing new things uh, becomes very difficult to do. And, and so, um, so, so, so very much not the case uh, to, to answer your question. Um, the, the, the challenges just, just continue to mount and get tougher and tougher. Um, and, you know, I'm going to get to costs in a second, because you brought up you know, costs of things, but I want to answer Lester's question. Lester says, you know, so what are you seeing as the primary way hackers are getting in? Is it phishing emails? Vivian, is there data on that? Yeah, right now, in general, for healthcare, I, I don't know if that question was just for healthcare, for all industries, but it's ransomware, phishing, and then business associates. So business associates then would become additional industries. So I don't know, Mike, is there a general trend for all industries? Uh, well, mostly, and, you know, this really goes toward easy ways to solve the problem. You know, it's it's user error. You know, somebody bites on something they shouldn't have. Somebody gives up their credentials because they thought that was really SharePoint that they were being asked to log into, regardless of the fact that they were already logged into the network and they're not supposed to get a password request anyway. Um, so, you know, frankly, we spend a lot of time and money doing this over and over and over testing your users with phishing messages to see if they'll bite on it, right? And in hospitals, the churn, the you know, the 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 rate that they need to hire nurses, for example, means everybody's new all the time. And so there's not really enough time to get, you know, good tribal knowledge up or or instill this culture of security when people, you know, are moving through the system this fast. But this thing that we do of, you know, testing the users over and over, it, 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 it always asymptotes at, you know, three to 5%, right? Recidivism. And, and, and you're never going to be perfect at that. And since only one person needs to bite on something, you've accomplished nothing with that. And what makes much more sense is to, and, and I forget who we talked to before. I think it was somebody from Billings or something. Um, they did an evaluation of who really needs email in the organization, and they cut everybody else off from from external email. That's brilliant. Um, but if you combine, you know, multi-factor authentication everywhere, um, along with a policy that strongly encourages all personal use to be on a personal device, you run a whole lot of that problem off a cliff. So the number one way is user error. You know, clicking, giving up credentials, things like that. It's also these 
problems where um, something goes vulnerable and a lot of it's exposed to the internet and people aren't getting it patched fast enough. So there was the exchange server problem that is continuing now. Um, you know, so it's, it's failure to get uh, things exposed to the internet that are vulnerable fixed before the bad guys get there with the tools to get in. That's the other way, but f far and away, it's, it's user error. John, do you agree with that? Is that what you see as the main attack vector? Completely, 100%. And in terms of ways that they get in, you know, or, so that the main attack vector, is that also the main success vector? Is through people still, you think? It, it's, it's the easiest and, and uh, most vulnerable um, aspect. I, one of my favorite stories, and you can Google it because I'll probably botch it a little bit, but, you know, several years ago, a, a group in London um, did, did, a, did an assessment where they went to a train station in London and, and they offered candy bars in exchange for people to give up their credentials and, and they were successful 300 times. And so people like chocolate more than they like protecting the, the organization. So, you know, it can be as simple as that. Right? Um, but uh, but Mike's exactly right. It, you, you can put all these programs in place and train people all you want, um, but it just takes one person. And, and if you look at the anatomy of an attack, you know, they, they get credentials, they get in. Um, they, they sit around and they, they wait until they can gain escalated um, privileges. And so, you know, they, they could set a lot of times when, when people go back and look at when they were first impacted, it could have been six months ago. Um, you know, so they're, they're very patient. Yeah. And, and you, you just jogged my memory on something too. And this is very recent news. People are being offered large sums of money to go in and intentionally infect their organization with ransomware. I don't know if they're giving them a USB stick to go jack in or what they're doing, or, you know, hey, just click this link for us or whatever. Um, people are now being, so this is a new one, you know? I mean, you can have somebody break into your network because you haven't patched your vulnerabilities. Uh, a user can click on something, or this can be now 100% intentional because somebody's being paid to do it. And, That's and, scary. And, and Mike, you and I just talked this morning. There's a Nigerian yeah. gang yeah. offering a million dollars for this, A million right? dollars. <laughs> and, um, and believe me, if you were one of the people that has been, you know, working this frontline COVID stuff and you were just beat to death, that might be a really attractive offer. Ugh. That is scary. Um, hey, so I want to get to David's question here. Blocking access to personal email has been the number one best security change we've yep. done in recent years. What framework audit evaluates that? I don't think any of them do. I think they all, well, they all talk about your, you know, your email security and your filtering. And you can say, well, yeah, we, we filter, we filter out all the email. <laughs> That's a really good answer. Yeah. I, um, you know, David, we were in another conversation about insurance and what, um, you know, what, what you could do to bring your insurance rates down. Uh, and I wonder whether that would be part of it, because I know that's another challenge. We need another webinar about that, which is, um, uh, which is, you know, while all these other things are happening and all these costs are, 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 are skyrocketing, one of them is insurance during the pandemic as well. Um, and, you know, insurance also plays a part in this, right? Because, you know, I, what, Mike, didn't, uh, didn't another insurance company just get breached, uh, Tokyo Marine? Uh, yes. And um, interestingly, and some of the stuff that they lift is policy details for, you know, their, their customers that have cyber policies so that they know where to set the extortion demand just below the threshold of, you know, what they're going to pay out. Yeah. Um, hey, um, uh, one other thing that came up in the report was the Conti ransomware. The Conti ransomware, you know, um, uh, you know, really mainly impacted healthcare organizations. Um, you know, John and Mike, was Conti different than other ransomware other than the target? I think it was just the focus of the gang that, you know, the, the way that victims are picked out for stuff like this is because they're so critical that they cannot stand any downtime at all. And, it, you know, it is a business model of these criminal gangs, you know, to seek out those organizations. 
And I think some of them were probably not really down with the whole, let's go after the health sector in a pandemic thing, but the Conti gang was. And I, I, I don't think it was um, technical characteristics. I think it was the focus of the gang. John, yeah. what did you see there? Yeah. Well, I, I, I would kind of, you know, add to what Mike's saying is that, you know, now we're dealing with threats from organized criminals and from nation state actors. And their, their entire intent is to disrupt the infrastructure of, of the country. And so, you know, a lot of times we go directly to, um, you know, an oil pipeline or electric grid or something like that, but disrupting healthcare, especially during a pandemic, is is achieving the same thing, and certainly more vulnerable to paying high ransoms when we've got a, a, a hospital full of patients, nowhere to transfer them to, and and now our systems are down. You know, a million dollar ransom seems like a, a a sure thing to pay to to get the systems back online so we can take care of patients. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, again, I have to. This is where I would curse and tell everybody <laughs> disgusting that they do it. But we did talk about costs a little before. Uh, you know, one of the stunning things to me, obviously, was that you know, Scripps hundred and thirteen million dollars before the class action lawsuits. University of Vermont also said that their attack was costing them $1.2 million a day. Right. What, what, you know, John, what leads to the, to the, I mean, these insane costs uh, of a ransomware attack? Why so high? Yeah. Um, and the number may have changed since the last time I looked at it, but the number I always used was, you know, typical breach costs you about $400 per record. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that $400 number. Um, but if you have a million records that are breached times $400, that, that gets very large very quickly. And, um, you know, some of that is paying for, um, you know, monitoring for, you, you know, your, your credit and things like that based on your information being stolen. Um, you know, typically you, you pay for those patients um, credit monitoring for a year uh, is, is kind of the, the standard. Um, your insurance costs, deductibles are going up, even though you have cyber insurance, you know, a, a $10 million policy is not going to cover uh, at $400 a record times a million records, you know, 10 million is just going to be a splash in the bucket. So, uh, and, and that's after your deductible. So, you know, I, I think that, that, that is part of the reason why the insurance companies are tightening the screws and they're starting to come back and say, you need to have these things in place before we'll even consider insuring you uh, or even seeing um, not, not just solutions, but particular vendors being required uh, as, as part of the agreement to insure you. Yeah. And that's and what I've seen too. And that seems a bad way to do it to me to pick out. Well, we see fewer things happen if you have this Palo Alto firewall. So if you have that, you get insurance. I don't think that's a good way. To, I don't think these guys are going about this the right way. They don't well, listen to me though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everyone should listen to me. Um, hey, but, but you know, one thing they should listen to you about, you know, they, um, um, you know, I think it's pretty clear that there is no hundred percent way to keep the bad guys out. Like right. that's not a thing that's not happening. This is so risk management. It's risk management. So, you know, it's about limiting the impact of an attack when it happens. Mike, how do you do that? Well, so if you think about, you know, an expression, the generalized expression for risk, there's two parts to it. There's the likelihood that this bad thing is going to happen. And what are the bad things? You can lose records, you can have your money stolen, or you can just get knocked down. I mean, that's basically it. Um, so, in order to buy down that risk, you add preventive controls. So it's firewalls and email filtering. And if you go zero trust, I mean, train your users, manage your vulnerabilities. All those things are designed to make a bad thing not happen. But the bad thing is going to happen. You will never buy that risk all the way down to a probability of zero by working on just the likelihood term. And then to your point, there's the impact term. And so to limit impact, you want to see that something has happened on this, something has gone wrong on that network as soon as possible. Because, you know, for example, the, the, the endpoint agent you have out there, you know, antivirus is not 100% effective. So stuff is going to sneak through. Um, but if you have good monitoring going on, especially if you're using some of the, the newer features with 
um, uh, like Microsoft's, uh, but they used to call it uh, advanced threat protection. I think they just call it Defender for Defender for Endpoint. Yeah, Defender for Endpoint. Okay, so you know, piece of malware may have been missed because it didn't have a signature. But once your computer starts to scan the network looking for open SMB shares to go reinfect other things, that's when the alert needs to fire off, right? So the thing landed, but then you detect the signal on the network and with the endpoints and the logs and aggregate all that stuff. So it's monitoring, investigation, confirmation, and effective response that turns that piece of malware into a tree falling in the forest rather than the network is now locked up and we have a disaster on our hands. Yeah. So it's it, that's really to manage impact. You got to monitor your network and you got to put out little fires before they get big. Cool. Um, I want to tell folks we have just under 10 minutes left. So if you have any questions, throw them in the chat here. Um, and, um, uh, you know, Mike, one of the things that, that, that we want to hit here is, you know, so how do we stop this in the future? And one of the things that, that you've talked about a lot is the, rhetoric around ransomware changing yes. um, and the way the federal government thinks about ransomware, especially in the healthcare space. Yes. So um, um, there are 16 critical sectors and health is one of them, right? Dams, water, finance, energy, all those. Well, health is one of those. So we call those critical infrastructure. And for unknown reasons, it's taken this long for us to say, if you are disruptive towards critical infrastructure using these cyber tools, you're not a criminal, you're a terrorist. That's always the way it was for things like knocking down buildings and you know all of the other bad things that uh, we were afraid of after September 11th. Well, this is the way terrorism is being manifest right now. The federal government has changed its rhetoric around this. And as I said, you know, they even put out this, the State Department put out this $10 million bounty on anyone who can provide information that connects the criminal gangs to the government uh, uh, where they reside. And that is, uh, that is sending a very clear message that we now have a different set of tools that we're going to bring to bear on this. And, um, you know, I think everybody remembers the, the term extraordinary rendition. You know, honestly, that happens a couple of times and we make that real public. I think the ransomware operators and other criminals move on to softer targets. Um, that means that has nothing to do with records continuing to be stolen from hospitals, right? Because that's criminal. But disrupting the operation, making a hospital inoperable, that's terrorism. So that nuance right there is starting to be heard by, you know, the ransomware operators and again, you know, public hangings on live TV and all of a sudden, you know, this starts to abate. Uh, John, what's your take on, on, I mean, is this, are we at the point where the federal government just needs to start calling them terrorists and take action for this to stop? I, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that at, at some point we're outgunned. Um, you know, we, we can't compete against organized crime. We can't compete against nation state actors. And, uh, you know, there, there's simply not enough resources at our disposal to, to do that within healthcare. And so I, I think at some point we have to look at how we enlist that, that help, um, and, and completely agree with Mike on getting tougher around the terminology. Let's call it what it is. Let's call it terrorism and let's go deal with it in that manner. Um, and then David in the chat, uh, um, it says, according to respondents, an average of 395 hours each week detecting uh, and containing malware because of false positives or false negatives. Approximately 4% of all malware alerts are investigated. On average, organizations receive 17,000 malware alerts in a typical week, but only 19 are deemed to be reliable. You know, Mike, your response to that? You're muted. You're that's that's why, you know, companies like ours and a whole lot of others like ours exist, because we're the focal point for the resources that can have eyes on glass 24-7, 365. And in most, not all, most organizations, they repurpose their IT folks and they go, well, security is part of your job. So along with the whole digital transformation and making sure that, you know, we have working telehealth systems, um, you know, keep an eye on those logs. 
you know, and and that's that's why you know, there's this thing alert fatigue, and very few of these are investigated properly. So it's really a you know you can set up your own dedicated SOC to do this. Um, you're going to need to hire 12 employees to cover vacations uh, for a 24/7, 365 operation, you know, or go to a managed service. Yeah. Yeah. And- and Jake, I, I, I would add that those statistics that David provided are exactly what security teams need to use to justify um, acquiring this type of service. Yeah. It, it, it's impossible for, uh, well, I would say a small team, but even a large team to, to keep up with the number of alert, alerts and, um, and information, false negatives. It, it, it's a huge task. And you know, in, in organizations, it's hard to get FTEs. Um, and, and so using that information to your advantage to, to um, entice the organization to spend the money on an MDR service or, you know, so, something like that is, is well worth it. Um, so uh, we have uh, four minutes left here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the survey in the chat. Um, and then get final thoughts. We'd really love uh, for you all to uh, take the survey. Um, I forgot to mention one of the things we started doing the pandemic at the end of the survey, you can get a gift card for yourself or you can donate it to a food bank. Uh, And uh, a lot of folks opt for that. So please take the survey. Um, The other thing I wanna say is one of the things that I mentioned in the, that we mentioned uh, in the survey there is, because of the pandemic, we started offering one of the one of the things we do uh, at no cost, and it's called a 13 point assessment. And it just gives you a snapshot of where you are. Um, and um, uh, we have room for four of them in September. So if folks are interested in doing that 13 point assessment, it's spending an hour with one of our um, uh, one of our security strategists um, answering a bunch of questions uh, and they sort of, they'll give you a readout um, of where you are. It doesn't replace a full assessment. It's not against HIPAA, um, but but just, you know, if you're really strapped and need to just do it for an hour, um, we'll help you with that. So click on there and you can you can you can um, uh, you can ask for it there as well. All right. Final thoughts. And what do you think is going to happen uh, or what is happening here in the second half of the year? Let's start with Vivian. Yep. So I want to thank everyone, of course, for joining today. I see people from all sorts of organizations, even outside of healthcare. So I want to first also say thank you to all, you know, healthcare organizations for taking care of your communities. Um, And just really security, you know, honestly, probably is now back on the back burner because of patient care priorities. But make sure, you know, keep going down that security roadmap, try and bring it back up with the board and justify, you know, hardening your defenses. So, and when we look at the data again, you know, the, the problem's of course not gonna get better and it just looks like it's gonna get worse and hacking again is gonna be on an increase is our predictions. So what you could do now could help prevent some of the impacts that you may have um, in the future. Um, and John, you're next. As John talks, I'm gonna put up our email addresses if anybody needs to contact us. Uh, you can do so through me or talk to folks directly. John, final thoughts. Yeah, I, I would just add to what Vivian said. I mean, the, the data uh, bears out that the, the trend is, is continuing continuing upward, and, and we certainly uh, feel that and understand that. We've got to remain diligent. Um, you know, we, we can't afford to to get distracted, and it's easy to do so in, in the current environment that we're in with a pandemic going on and, and no end in sight. So just, um, you know, leverage what you can to uh, continue to to build and enforce your security posture. Mike, final thoughts. So here's what's going to happen. So first of all, with the uh, passage of the infrastructure bill, there's going to be a lot of money available for hospitals as critical infrastructure to, to finance some security. Man, take advantage of that. Number two, um, the government is going to get into this reinsurance business. There's already something called the Terrorism Reinsurance Program, TRIP. There's another one called TRIA. This is mainly about, you know, buildings get knocked down, but they're talking about extending this and becoming a reinsurer because right now insurance companies say, well, if you're calling it terrorism, we don't have to, we don't have to cover an act of war. 
or active terrorism. So government's got to get involved there. Um, they're already looking at, uh, for example, the anonymity of cryptocurrency transactions and trying to unmask that. And finally, there will be, I, 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 I am going to stick with this, there will be, if the government's going to be there as the reinsurer to make things right, there will be a prohibition on paying ransom. And that is going to drive the business model of these gangs into the ground, and they're going to go look for softer targets. I think all those things are going to happen. We shall see. All right. Um, so uh, if you haven't gotten the report, shoot me an email. I'm going to send out an email that has a recording, that has the report, that has Mike's spreadsheet that makes vendors cry. Um, you'll get a couple of emails from us, one from the system, and then one from me. If you need anything from us, jake at criticalinsight.com. And have an awesome day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully all of you are wrong and uh, breaches go down in the back half of the year. Um, and all of you who work at, uh, at healthcare, uh, at patient-focused organizations, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Yeah. All right.